Amen. All right, if you take your Bibles with you and be turned to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, chapter number 8. We'll begin reading in uh, verse 26. So when you get there, if you will stand in reverence to the reading of the Word of God, uh, we'll read uh, verse 26 down to the end of the chapter. And it says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto uh, Gaza, which is desert. And he arose, and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the, the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for, uh, for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, Read, uh, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit of the Lord, or spirit, said unto Philip, "Go near and join thyself to his, this chariot." And Philip ran thither to him, and he heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, "Understandest thou what thou readest?" And he said, "How can I, except some man uh, guide me?" And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began uh, at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when uh, they were come up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord uh, called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went, went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at uh, uh, Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities, till he came to Caesarea. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you for uh, letting us gather here in your name tonight, Lord, and for uh, letting us look, look at your word, Lord, and hopefully we can learn something from it. In these next few moments, Lord, I ask that you uh, clear our hearts and our minds and you help us to focus on only you. That we'll be able to learn from your word, that we'll be able to grow closer to you tonight, Lord, and we'll be able to better understand what you would have us to do in this, in this world, Lord. And I just ask that you uh, use me as your vessel uh, this evening, Lord, that I, and have me say only the things that you would have me to. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight I want to talk to you about uh, divine appointments. And uh, Philip here, it's uh, one of my favorite Bible stories. I say that often because I guess I have a lot of favorite Bible stories. But uh, uh, I, this one I, I do find very intriguing. And then we pick up in the story. Uh, in chapter number 7, you know, the, or in, the, in, the, in the book of Acts, the, the church begins to grow. You have the day of Pentecost in which 3,000 souls were added, and you have all these things happening, and an explosion going on, and really the world is ready for salvation. Because they've been commanded in chapter 1, Jesus commanded his apostles as he was ascending before them to go into all the world. But, but he told them, Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. Told them to go everywhere preaching the gospel. Well, the problem was, they didn't go everywhere. They stayed there in Jerusalem. And, because, and the people in Jerusalem were getting saved, and how great is that? But, that's, but God had commanded them to not stay in Jerusalem, but to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. So, uh, so by then, God allowed persecution to hit the church. In chapter number 7, we find uh, the first martyr recorded being Stephen. And that's where we found uh, Saul of Tarsus, who was 
there and he was consenting to his death. He was there. He held the coats. He's the one who gave the okay to stone him. He was very much involved in it. And then after that, uh, we say is whenever the, the Bible really begins to talk about persecution in chapter number eight. And the, and the Bible uses the words that, the, that Saul of Tarsus wreaked havoc on the church. You know, and, I, and, I, and in my own life, I have to look at the things that, that go, that where God has to correct me and the bad things that I go through because I'm hard-headed and won't listen. It, it happen, it, it's happened in my life, and we won't get into it, but whenever you do the things that make you comfortable. I'll give one quick illustration. I always make good grades in school. I'm not trying to, uh, sound, uh, trying to make myself as a genius or anything, but... Uh, but I was called, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, everyone always said, you know, you should be a doctor or a lawyer or any of these things. And I think if you want me to be honest with you, I think uh, it may have hurt some feelings when I said that I wanted to be a preacher. But I began to listen to some of those people around me. And if you ever want to make a mistake as, uh, as a preacher, let them listen to the, to the people who introduce you and believe everything that's being said about you. Because, you know, they're only going to share the good things. See, you know the low down, dirty, rotten you. But I began to listen to a lot of these people. And to this point, I had never had any issues with blood or broken bones. I've never broke a bone. But things like that didn't bother me. But as I began to listen to these people and I decided, you know what? You know, maybe they are right. I can go and I can become a doctor and I can become a Christian doctor and do lots of good things. And yes, we need Christian doctors. However, I, I stand before you tonight and tell you that was not God's will for my life. And I can remember I was making my mind up that that is what I was going to do with my life. I was going to go to medical. I was going to go to school, go to medical school, become a doctor, and make lots of money, help people in the process, but be a Christian doctor. You know, God has a funny way of getting your attention because if after church tonight you began telling me this gruesome story of how you broke your arm and it was a compound fa fracture and how and, and you know start telling me this gruesome story, you would probably see my face turn flush. And because I can't even stand the thought of anything like that. If I see, I'm not so bad that as soon as I see blood, but you know, if you ever want to get me, send a video of a UFC fight where somebody breaks their leg or something gruesome, and yeah, I'm not going to watch that. As soon as I see that, I'm closing it and like, nope, I'm done. Uh, because, but I, I believe that God used that to correct me, and that's what He was doing with the church here. Was I, it was He was allowing persecution because they were hard headed and didn't listen, just like at the Tower of Babel, whenever. They decided that they were going to stay in one city. They were going to build a tower up to heaven. They weren't listening to God because God had told them to go populate the entire earth. But they decided, no, we're going to stay right here. So God confounded their language and made sure they went the opposite ways and went to all the world. But that's what happened with the church here. Saul was wreaking havoc because, of, uh, because people weren't listening to God. And then we see the first mention of Philip in chapter number 8 in verse number 5. It says, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. You know, I'm noticing a common theme with Philip is that he preaches Christ. Can I tell you, if there's a preacher preaching anything else, he's not worth listening to. He's not a preacher of God. But uh, he preached Christ. And uh, verse number six continued, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out uh, of many that were possessed with them. And many taken palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. You see, Philip was one of the ones who was displaced. He had to go to Samaria. And if you know the history behind uh, Israel and Samaria, they didn't like each other. You know, the Jews would often call the Samaritans dogs. So it wasn't just that they didn't like each other. The Jews thought they were better than the Samaritans. And yet that's where Philip found himself. But what did he do while he was there? He preached Jesus. And many believed and, and there was a noise in the city because of what happened. So then we skip there, you know, we, we skip down uh, here because the next verses is talking about Peter. And, uh, but the next mention of Philip is where we begin reading in verse 26. 
And after all these things are going well in Samaria, after people are getting saved and the, there's a buzz about the town and things are going great, we see the, the angel of the Lord come to Philip and, the, and tells him, and I can pick up a reading in the verse, it says, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. The first thing we see is the call to go. The spirit of the or the angel of the Lord. Um, I was reading some commentaries, and typically in the Old Testament, when it refers to the angel of the Lord, it is speaking of Jesus. It's a uh, Christophany, uh, an Old Testament sighting of Christ. However, the way the Greek is, most believe that this was uh, just an angel. But the angel came to him and told him, said, "Hey, everything's going great here. There's people getting saved, but I want you to go to the desert." You know. If you're Philip, it would have been easy to have said, but things are going good here. Or it would have been easy to have taken the Jonah path and said, you want me to go that way? Okay, I'm going this way. And, and not even listen. But we find no hesitation. The second thing we see is the obedience of Philip. And, he, and the Bible says in verse 27, and he arose and went. What an amazing thing. There was no argument with God. There was, there was, God didn't have to do anything to get his attention. God didn't have to hit him over the head. God didn't have to bring persecution to Samaria. When God, when the angel of the Lord came to him and told him to go, he didn't hesitate. He just got up and went. He got up and went to the desert where there was a divine appointment waiting on him. You know, it is, it, it's very easy to, when you're in a comfortable place, to sit back and look at, look at things and say, you know what? I like my current situation. And Pastor talked about this recently it, uh, of what brought him back to, uh, to the States. He said he was comfortable in Northern Ireland. He, he was comfortable being a missionary. And, uh, and, but God began to make him uncomfortable. You know, Philip had already en endured, no doubt, some persecution in the in Jerusalem. So when he left, I'm sure that was still fresh on his mind and, and God still had his attention. But the best thing any of us can do is when God tells us to go, is to go. Because there's a reason God tells us to go. Yeah, and you see, if Philip hadn't gone, and, uh, we'll, and we'll get into this a little more, but he was going to meet someone who God had, had in place for him we call it a divine appointment where God sets the appointment. We just have to show up. And you see, God was able to use this. He was able to use Philip to reach this Ethiopian eunuch who uh, was, by accounts, and what we would call probably the secretary of state to his native country. Some scholars believe modern day Sudan, but... They believe, or, but he was able to take the gospel to them. And since he was in a position of prominence, people listened to him. So if Philip hadn't listened to God and went, then the gospel would have been delayed getting to the world. Right. You see, sometimes, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone else, but sometimes God tells us to go. God wants us to, to have somebody for us to reach. And... We're comfortable where we're at. We're comfortable doing what we're doing. And we think, no, somebody else will get it. I should have mentioned it in prayer requests, but I have a customer who's uh, only 43 years old and has had just a multitude of health issues. He had his first stroke at the age of 30. A year and one day later, he had his second stroke. And then... Uh, I think five years ago, he went to the dentist for a routine checkup and the dentist found a spot that, that concerned her and she, done, and she began to do research and she found that, it, that she believed that it was this specific kind of very rare cancer. And so she sent him on to somebody more experienced than, than herself and they, be, they checked, checked him out and sure enough, it was this very rare cancer. So rare that Vanderbilt Hospital had never seen it. This led to his jaw being completely amputated. And they took part of his femur 
and reconstructed a jawbone. And then he had to have some lymph nodes removed. And then that caused, and I don't remember what it's called, but it called it caused the remaining lymph nodes to go to one spot to focus on that. So that leg had to be amputated, and now he's about to lose his other leg. And as I look around at this man's place, I got, I got the feeling very quickly that he's an atheist. And he doesn't have any family that lives around here. He's got family in Virginia and family in Atlanta, but no family here. So he's a lonely man, and after, uh, and, I, and I, I probably, as far as from a business aspect, I spent too much time talking to him yesterday, but it wasn't, but I don't believe it was a waste of time. And I, I, throughout this conversation, I, I, look, I sought for a way to try to sneak God in, you know, literally sneak him in, but try to find that good pivot point. And, you know, I asked him if he, if, he believe, if, he, if he believed in God. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I used to. He told me, but everything I've been through lately, he said, or it's been through in the past several years, he said, I just don't think there could be a God. And if you want me to be honest with you, talking to this man yesterday, I understand what he's saying. I told him, I said, I've not gone through, I said, I, I told him, I said, respectfully, I have to disagree with you. I believe that there is a God and that you'll stand before him one day. I said, now I've not been through everything that you have, but, and I, but I can see where you're coming from. And I'm, and I'm hoping, and the conversation didn't really get a chance to go much of anywhere, but I'm hoping to get the opportunity again uh, to talk to him because uh, his health just isn't doing well. So if y'all could remember a man by the name of John in your prayers, he's, you know, had a, had a hard life. And, um, but uh, you see, it is intimidating whenever you're standing there talking to someone and you look over and, say, and see a sticker that says Darwin loves you. So you already know how they feel. And it's uncomfortable to bring up God in that situation. And it's uncomfortable whenever they're sitting there going, going through all those things. But somebody needs to share the gospel with them. And, and can I tell you that each and every person in here, God has people that you can reach and nobody else. Because they may know you, they may trust you, or you may be the one that has time to reach that person. And we don't know what kind of an impact that'll have. I have a feeling because as, as we read it toward the end of, our, of the chapter here that the eunuch saw him no more. I don't believe Philip knew the impact that he had on the world. He just did what God told him to do. So we see that we, we see the obedience of Philip. Next we see the obedience of the Spirit. You know, not only does he go down to this desert place, but in verse 29, we'll read it again. It says, Then the Spirit said unto him, Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Now, I want you to think about this, because I, I like putting myself in these stories and trying to imagine what happened. But Philip gets to Gaza, he gets to the desert, and uh, you know the whole way there, he is wondering why he's going there. Not, not necessarily questioning it, but what does God have going on? You know, or what does God have for me? Why is he taking me to this place? And he gets there, and there's a chariot, and the, and the Spirit tells him, says, hey, go get in that chariot. And then what does he do? Verse 30, and Philip ran thither to him. So, he, again, he didn't hesitate. He didn't think, well, that'll be a little weird if this guy sees me, sees me, you know, just running up to his chariot. You know, in the day and age we live in, you probably don't want to run up and try to yank somebody's car door open and jump in with them. That may not go very well. But uh, he, 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 when the Spirit said go, he went without hesitation. And... We, and, we, and we find, as we read these next few verses, and we'll read the rest of uh, verse 30, it says, And heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said unto him, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? So, Philip just asked him, says, Hey, he hears him reading Isaiah, Isaiah 53, as we find out. But he hears him reading Isaiah, and he says, Hey, do you know what you're reading? 
And this Ethiopian eunuch who we've established is a, great, is a man of great power in his native country. Uh, he's, you know, he's in a position of power. He's probably not dealing with the day-to-day tasks. He says, how can I understand this except some, somebody show me? You see, we, we read in verse uh, tw- uh, 26 where he was, where Philip was commanded to go, oh, go down from Jerusalem, or where, or where, go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza. So, context clues there t- tells us that more than likely this Ethiopian eunuch was coming from Jerusalem. It tells us that he was probably searching for something. And by something, he was looking for, looking for fulfillment. He was looking for God. And I believe that's why he went to Jerusalem. Now, when he got to Jerusalem, who knows what he found? Because again, Saul was wreaking havoc on the church. He, he, he didn't find what he was looking for in, Jer- in Jerusalem. Can I uh, be frank with you? There will be a whole lot more people find Jesus outside these walls than inside these walls. Amen. And a lot of them are like this eunuch where they don't understand what they're looking for. They're, not, they're more than likely not going to pick up a Bible, read it, and think, I need Jesus. Or they're not going to pick up a track and read it. There are some, but most of them are going to need a little bit of help. They're going to need somebody to explain it. Not because they're ignorant, because I don't believe this man was ignorant for, for one moment. But because spiritual things can be a little bit complicated. And uh, so, as we go out into the world, we should be cognizant of that because most people that are looking for something may never set foot in this church. There's a lot of lost people out in the world who think nothing, they think the only people that go to church are goody two-shoes, they don't get out and work, they don't live in the real world, and they're judgmental and think they're better than everybody else and they're hypocrites. And they will not dare step one foot inside the church. That's why we're commanded to go. Not to stay in the church, but to go. One of the moments of realization for for me, talking biblically, was when Moses was up in the mountain talking to God and getting the Ten Commandments. And, uh, you know, he's literally spending time with God and how great that must have been. But he had to go down from the mountain to correct the people who had already seen God work in miraculous ways. But Moses couldn't stay right there in the presence of God. He had to go to the people. You know, I'm afraid in our churches today, even good churches, if you will, that there's a lot of spiritually fat people. And what do I mean by that? I mean, they know the Bible. They know the Romans road. They know how to lead somebody to Christ. They know that they should go and tell people, but they don't. But the the eunuch here, he's struggling to understand what he's reading. And we get down uh, to the the end of verse 34, or, or to verse 34. It says, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Because he's just reading about how the, cru- the cru- he's reading about the crucifixion hundreds of years before the crucifixion happened. So he doesn't understand. Again, he, as you would say, as we say around here, he ain't from around here. And he didn't know everything that had just happened. He didn't know about Jesus who had been crucified. But he knew that the prophet was speaking about someone that was going to change the world. But he didn't understand if it was the prophet speaking about himself, Isaiah, Isaiah being the prophet, or about someone who was coming later. So... So we find Philip helping him. We find Philip explaining the Bible to him. And we find Philip, it says in verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So you see, he didn't try to take him somewhere else. He used that scripture, he used Isaiah, and he he explained it to him and preached Jesus unto him. You know, there's a lot of 
feel-good messages in the Bible. You can take verses of the Bible, such as Romans 8, 28, which says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, those who are called according to His purpose. And you can twist that scripture and convince somebody that everything is going to work out great in your life. You can, well, you can take Jeremiah 29, 11 and, and build puff people up and make them think that, that hey, as long as, uh, as long as you claim God, everything is going to go fine and dandy in your life. Except whenever you start to find the people who were close to God, such as the apostles, I don't think any of them died a dignified death. You look at Paul after the, the transformation of Saul to Paul, and he was beaten, drugged, stoned, uh, and then eventually beheaded and then prisoned for years. How would you like to look at him and say, hey, everything's going to go good. You're just not naming it and claiming it. But the, the important thing here was that Philip preached Jesus. You know, there's going to come a day when the only thing that matters, and I'm going to tell you that day is today, but there's going to come a day at, at a judgment when the only thing that matters is, do you know Jesus as your Savior? You can make all the money in the world that you want. You can have all the nice things here on the earth that you want. I referenced it Sunday, but you could, you, we can go to Luke chapter 14 and read about the rich man and Lazarus and how the rich man fared sumptuously and he had all the fine things. I'm sure he had the nicest chariots around and he had the nicest horses and the nicest house and, and all these things. But in the end, what was he doing? He was begging for Lazarus to bring him one drop of water. And after that happened, he, he, he was asking that Lazarus be raised from the dead so that he can go and tell his brothers because he didn't want his brothers to, be, to, to go to that place where he, was, where he was. He wanted his brothers to escape that place. Can I tell you that hell is full of people today who are crying out and if we could speak to them today, they would be telling us the same thing that the rich man was. Saying, hey, don't let anyone come here. But far too often we're too afraid of, or our life gets too busy, we're too afraid of being ridiculed. Because can I tell you, it's not fun when you bring Jesus up to someone and they curse him or curse you or call you every name in the book for believing the, what, what you believe. It's, it's not fun. But let me ask you this. Would you rather th those people mock you or them never hear the gospel? I probably should have pulled it up and had, had it played tonight, but when, when I was in college, I was showed this video in a class and it's always stuck with me. Now, I may have used this illustration before. If I have, I apologize. I believe it's powerful, powerful though. There's these uh, magicians who go by the name Penn and Teller. One of them speaks, one of them doesn't. I, I've never watched any of their acts, but I am told that um, to say they hate God and hate Christians would be an understatement. That they constantly blaspheme God or the one that talks uh, does and they make fun of him and you know, they make fun of you if you're so simple as to believe in something so foolish. But this video that I'm talking about, uh, again, I, it's probably, I believe it's Teller, but don't hold me to that, who, who talks. And he's, give, he's, he's just talking into a camera, and he's, he begins to, to share the story of they did a show, and one of the security guards came up to him after the show, and, he's, and he said, hey, I've been you know, working your shows for a while now. And he said, and I know how you feel, but I have something for you. And he looked down and it was a New Testament. And what really caught this, this, this uh, magician off guard is he said, this is a really nice guy. And he said, now you know how I feel about God. He said, but this was, it was such a nice guy and everything. He said, uh, you know, I took it and I appreciated it. And he, and he kept going back to what a nice guy he, he was. And then he stopped and he, he said, again, you know how I feel about God. 
said, but if there's a freight train coming down the tracks and there's someone standing on those tracks, at what point do you go tackle them to get them off the tracks to keep them from getting hit by the train? And he said, and yet, according to Christians, there's something much worse than a freight train coming down the tracks. And you stay quiet about it. He said, you should do everything you could to share, to share the gospel. And again, this is from a devout atheist. Someone who spits in the, in the, uh, in the face of God about it. And he is telling, uh, telling anybody who watches the video that they're, that how wrong they are if they don't share the gospel. Because again, all that matters in the end is do you know Jesus? But so Philip preached, uh, uh, Philip preached in his name or in the name of Jesus. And then in verses 36 and 37, we find the acceptance of the gospel. And it says, And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What a powerful statement we find there. You know, because just more, or we don't know how much time has passed, but we know that uh, just a few verses prior, this eunuch is, is searching for something. I love to hear stories. I believe Pastor has one about, about uh, somebody, a lost person praying to God, and, you know, uh, looking for a sign, looking for him, and then somebody appears to share the gospel with him. I've heard stories like that so many times and, and, how, and how it always warms my heart. But I do wonder how often that prayer is made and maybe I miss the call. Where somebody is desperately searching, they're wanting to find God, but no one comes. But here, that, that wasn't the case. And in these short few verses, we find where this, this eunuch has reached the point where he says, Hey, here's water. What's keeping me from being baptized? And Philip, again, shared the gospel. And he said, If you believe with all your heart, you can. You know, one thing I'm very careful of when I share the gospel is to make sure the person understands. Because there's been too many Christians with good intentions that almost have, hey, do you want to go to heaven? Well, of course. You know, who doesn't want to go to heaven? All right, we'll say this prayer. And I'm not preaching against the sinner's prayer tonight. I, I, I promise you I'm not. But if all they did was say a prayer without believing in their heart, then all they did was say a prayer. Just like if you believe that water is going to get you saved... Or if someone believes water is going to get you, get them saved, and they get baptized, all they did was get wet. But you, salvation isn't just this feeling. It's not say these words or put this much money in the offering plate or do this many Hail Marys or you, you pick whatever good deed it is. It, it, it's not, never anything like that. Salvation is a heart matter. Salvation is believing in your heart. Because if, you, because if you miss that, then you're lost. But we find Philip, or, or this Ethiopian eunuch, getting saved, and then following the Lord and believers' baptism, which is very important, I believe, to growth. And then at the end of the baptism, in verse 39, we see, and when they, they were uh, come up from the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. You see, the eunuch, something changed in his life that day. And even though he didn't see Philip ever again, he went on his way rejoicing because of the change that had taken place in his life. Another thing to be careful of when you're out soul winning is winning that, is winning that person to yourself. 
Yeah, I don't remember who it was, but somebody said to me Sunday morning, uh, what a good crowd we had that usually when a pastor's out of town, it doesn't matter to the church, but when a pastor's out of town, the attendance is down. And my wife and I were discussing that because that's been my experience in church as well, is pastors out of town, less people come to church. But whenever that is the case, I wonder, and I'm not trying to preach against anybody, but I wonder what their motivations for church is. Because it shouldn't matter who's standing behind this pulpit. You should want to be at church if you're a child of God. And you should want to hear the Bible if you're a child of God. You should want to fellowship with other godly people if you're a child of God. It should, again, it shouldn't matter if the pastor's here or not. So we've got to be careful in winning people to the Lord, not ourselves. Because I can't save anybody. If somebody is counting on me to get them to heaven, I'm sorry, I can't even get myself there. If I can't get myself there, there's no way I can get you there. There's only one person that can do that. You're not going to get to heaven and ask somebody, hey, how did you get here? And, and they, they say, well, I did this. No, everybody in heaven got there one way, and it was by the blood of Jesus, and they're, and they're trusting in him to get them there. Amen. Then lastly, and we're done, we see the continuing of Philip's ministry. We began in chapter 8 and verse number 5 where we saw Philip go into Samaria and how he, the way I read it, turned, the, turned Samaria upside down for Jesus. And how there was a buzz about the city and then it goes from that to him going to the desert in the middle of nowhere and finding one man in a chariot and this one man getting saved. But then even after that, in verse 40, we, we find, But Philip was found at uh, <clears throat> Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. You see, he didn't stop there. The whole way back to Caesarea, he's, he's telling everybody about Jesus. He's telling everybody how they can get to heaven. He's telling everybody the most important thing that they can find out. You see... I've been taught my whole life, and I believe it to be true. If you're here on this earth, God has a purpose for you. If he didn't have a purpose, there would be no purpose in you being here. So if you're still here, God has something for you to do. And Philip didn't get caught. When in verse 39, we saw that he was caught away of the Spirit. He didn't get taken to heaven. No, he just went on his way. And was continue preaching in the name of Jesus. The whole time we're here, let's never get too important to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter if it's to one person or to hundreds of people or thousands of people or whatever. God has somebody out there that still needs to be saved. And we... You often hear people talk about end times and who knows if we are getting close to the end of times to the rapture. I have no idea. I'm not going to pretend to know. But if it is wrapping up, then our time's running short. And it should be our job and it should be our motivation to take as many people as we can to heaven. Not because of what I did. Not so I can say, hey, look at me. Look what I did. Because again, if I'm doing that, I don't know how many converts that I, that I have that God actually has. But even after a big victory, we're still to continue preaching the name of Jesus. It's easy to get discouraged. You see, uh, you see it time and time throughout the Bible. One of the most notable ones being Elijah. You know, you, find, you see Elijah having a battle with the prophets of Baal over whose God is real and... Uh, after, after God consumes his, consumes his altar and everything on it and all the water around it and everything else. And Elijah has this big victory. You find him running away because he's afraid of Jezebel and hiding and saying, I'm the only one left. Can I tell you, he wasn't the only one left. 
But if he was the only one left, that doesn't change his mission. Just like if you're the only believer around, that doesn't change your mission. Because we are to continue until we're not here anymore. That is our job here on this earth. Is to continue. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll close. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you for the example of Philip here and the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, Lord. And I ask that you help use it to help motivate us to reach people in your name, Lord, to go and to tell others about you and to hopefully see people get saved, Lord. Again, not for our honor or glory, because uh, our honor and glory doesn't mean anything, but Lord, so that they can know you and that they can find salvation in you and that they can know you. As, as we've previously talked about, the reward for knowing you isn't heaven. The reward for knowing you is knowing you. And Lord, I just ask you to help us to all grow more uh, soul cognitive and to be reminded uh, of our mission every day. Lord, I ask that you help us as we go our separate ways tonight, as we go back to the mission field, Lord, that we find somebody who's looking for you and share the gospel with, with them, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And amen.